so Mary Ann, uh, former principal, former superintendent, and uh, retired as superintendent Correct. of Franklin yeah. Public Schools. And now she wears a million hats that influence, uh, she influences education around the globe, lo her local community as uh, much as she can. And so I'm hoping that in our conversation, we'll talk about some of those things. Thank Maybe. you. Yeah. And it's all related. Yeah. yeah. It's all mm -hmm. interconnected, right? right? We sometimes forget that right. political part uh, as educators. We get so immersed in helping kids every day that we we forget about the influence that we need to have or to um, be involved in. Right, on our communities. Yeah, yeah. Right. So thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so Marianne, tell us about your time as um, a principal, school leader. What was your favorite thing about those jobs that you held? I uh, started out as an elementary teacher and uh, within, oh, maybe 10 years or so, um, transitioned into being an elementary school principal. And that was a result of someone recognizing that I might have the skill set that could be valuable in serving as a, as a leader. I, I think uh, whether it would have been as a principal, whether as a superintendent, or any of the roles that I hold today, the best part, the very best part is about the relationships with people. Whether it's being able to have a conversation with the first time kindergartner, the conversation with the uh, first time mom or dad who's bringing their child to school, or many, many, many years later when we run into those people that were a part of our early careers and they say, do you remember me? And, and sometimes, um, I don't remember, but they surely remember, and they always have stories about different things that have happened or things that they remember about when I was their teacher or principal or superintendent. And it's especially then that I realize how the important role that we play in the development of all of these people. Mm -hmm. You talked about relationships, and I think you mentioned a really important point that I thought about a lot over the years, and that is that sometimes as educators, we really don't know the impact that we're going to have on a person for years later, or maybe never, right? right? Because, right. Um, you know, when they're little, they'll bring you a flower, they'll give you a hug, uh, and for that day, it's kind of rewarding. But long term, oftentimes kids go off in the world and they never circle back or run into right, us again. Right. And, and so we have to be intrinsically motivated just by that relationship piece that right. you talked about and, and recognizing that today for this person, I made a difference. Correct. So Correct. what you said is that the relationship piece and everything you've done has been so important. Right. So yeah, right. That's exciting. What was the, um, if you think back, uh, what was the biggest challenge you faced as a school leader? Uh, oftentimes, uh, we are placed into positions where uh, we don't understand the culture of the of the community, the culture of the the building, the culture of the faculty, perhaps that's been around uh, for a long time. And so, I think that the most difficult piece as a leader is to just hold still and listen and learn about the community, the culture, um, as opposed to, ex especially when I was younger, um, I, I wasn't too keen on waiting to get started. I just wanted to jump in and let's go. And I would be, of course, met with some resistance because, because they weren't ready. And it wasn't they, it was me. Mm -hmm. I needed to just learn to listen and learn, listen, 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 and then be able to formulate a plan. So it was just really hard for me, especially in the beginning, to be patient. I, I certainly have gotten better with that over time. I think that comes with age, right? <laughs> we learn patience. Um, yeah. So you talked about a couple of things. One is taking time to build your awareness mm -hmm. of the community mm -hmm. that you're serving and understanding um, 
the culture that they carry, and that even could be a family, right? Mm -hmm. If you're working with a, mm -hmm. a family with a child that's having struggles at mm -hmm. home. But it's about taking time to listen and become aware of their values and their beliefs uh, so that you can communicate in a way that makes sense to them Correct. and mm -hmm. build the relationship of trust so the teachers follow mm -hmm. or the <laughs> community follows mm -hmm. and respects your not only your position, but your expertise. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a nuance of leadership. Like we can't come in like the bowl in the China shop right. and just think we're going to move people because people don't work that way. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think that, uh, I better understand today the importance of, of community. So, so as a K-12 person, we often believe that our role is within the confines of our, our little building, when in fact, the community plays such a huge role in supporting uh, what we do. And it's really, really important for us to invest time in getting to know our community. And as difficult as it is, getting people from different uh, factions of the community involved in our school. Um, when I think back to uh, my time as principal at List Elementary School, uh, we had a number of, I wish I could remember the name of the, of the, the project, but there were these uh, senior citizens who had different talents. One, one lady, for example, could knit, another did crochet, another did woodworking, another guy did archery. And we set it up with the third and fourth grade where they would come in for a six week period and they would mentor though a group of kids um, in, a, in a special area. And just developing that rapport with those people and those people having a good feeling about what was happening in our school, and they go out and tell their friends, and they tell their friends, and then the next time it comes around where we're asking our community to support something that we're doing, we've created uh, a foundation of people who understand and who know us mm -hmm. and can support what we're doing, and that's just a little small snippet of creating that foundation out there, but an example of, of one of those projects. So a challenge of uh, being a leader is recognizing the need to not only be responsible for your building and the safety and security and the learning and of all the folks and they're the kids and the teachers, but also building connections outside so that it becomes a uh, support system for yeah, the school and, right. and it support system plays out as you described in your uh, story both supporting kids and learning a new skill also in a future maybe bond proposal because right. now they feel successful i also think of the relationship those build for those students when they're out in the community and they run into those people who mentored them and then they explained to their parents, oh, Mr. So-and-so comes in and teaches right. me archery every week. It, it just, right. Right. it changes. And you know, as educators, we are struggling sometimes with our, um, I don't want to say credibility, but our, the perception of the public of the work that we do and, and that it's easy. And we just, you know, with, we're glorified daycare changing that perception through things like you described is really right. important. And, and the principal has to facilitate that right. for sure to make the place open for people to come in. Cause if the, if the principal is focused on management and, and keeping everything kind of in line, <laughs> we aren't going to be able to. Grow. Right. Yeah. Right. I think that, um, communication, I think differently today about communication than I did as an, mm -hmm. as an elementary principal, for example. So, um, as an elementary principal, that newsletter, you know, that, that weekly newsletter that went out was really, really important. Um, and, and what I've learned today, um, now as, as a mayor, mm -hmm. uh, the importance of communicating with people in the way that they want to read something or they want to, mm -hmm. to hear the story. And one of the pieces that I did not pay much attention to as a superintendent 
was the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would send out a, a newsletter to the to the families, but didn't write necessarily for the the local newspaper. And now, as a mayor, I have started to write a column uh, biweekly about you name it. We're writing about it, and the number of people that read that newspaper, I had no idea mm -hmm. that that population was out there. They are, they're older. Mm -hmm. And I can see the value today that um, had, had, I, had I communicated with that group of people through the newspaper, the relationships could have been even stronger. Yeah. Um, but we have to communicate with people in, in the way that they would like to read the information. And is it more work? Yep, it <laughs> certainly is. But building those relationships, that foundation, that we need them there when we need help, whether it's a crisis, whether it's a bond issue, whether it's just to support the football team that's leaving for a, a tournament. Uh, it, we need to be a we as a community. And through communication, we can build that foundation. And, and and today, sometimes at social media, I see that you, as the mayor, post social media mm -hmm. um, posts all the time. And so we have to go to them. In right. The that makes sense. Correct. Makes sense. Correct. Okay. I want to shift uh, gears just a bit. Uh -huh. So you mentioned that you became a principal because early on someone recognized potential leadership capacity right. in you. And I had a similar experience. Mm -hmm. And I... Don't know if I would be where I'm at today if it weren't for this mentor who really kind of picked me out and said, hey, right, what are you paying right, attention to? Right. How important is that for a school leader right now who, among all the other tasks they're trying to do, to think about building and supporting another person in leadership? What, what do you, what's your advice yeah, about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I... One of, one of the things that happens when, when we as leaders recognize a teacher uh, that has leadership capacity, um, I, I can almost know exactly what they're going to say to me. They're going to say, oh, oh, I want to work with the kids. Mm -hmm. And if I become a principal or if I become a superintendent or whatever it might be, then I won't have the opportunity to work with the kids. And... My response today is, oh, you'll be working with the kids. <laughs> you'll be working with the kids a lot because you can make that a part of your job. You work with kids in totally different ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that the second, the second thing that I like to share with them is it's really important to have great teachers in leadership capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, oftentimes, uh, we have people who choose leadership as a, as a role and, and perhaps they didn't like teaching or that it wasn't for them. And so they come to the table, uh, without the skill set that great teachers bring. And you know what, when you're a leader, you're teaching, yes. you're just teaching adults, you're teaching community members that teaching will be a part of what we do forevermore uh, because we have to continue to teach about what we do. And with that skill set that we've brought to the table, we can do a really good job at that. So you, you raise a few points. Uh -huh. One is that um, usually when you spot the leadership capacity in a person, they're, they're quite humble. Uh -huh. And so a, a principal in the current position uh, should be prepared to address that humbleness mm -hmm. when they are pro providing this uh -huh. opportunity to lead school improvement or lead chair a committee Correct. or finding opportunities for them to grow and, and lead their skills. So Correct. And we as the person that is identifying this person and, and trying to encourage them not once, but twice and three times, <laughs> we have to be there to support them. Mm -hmm. We can't just throw them to the wolves. We have to say, I think that you have this skill set and I'd love to support you in this initiative. And, and of course we do that. We, we model what that behavior looks like, but we also have to be there physically to support those people as they 
take on new challenges. And this is an important skill for principals right now as we have a shortage, right? We have a Correct. shortage of teachers, Correct. we have a shortage of educators. And uh, it's easy to put a, per, a body into a position. But if we're not putting the right bodies into, into the right positions, we're going to have continued struggle. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Um, finding the, the what, what might be some of those skills that you recognize in a teacher leader that, that I'm, I'm pressing on. I have the skills that uh, uh, if I'm a, a newer principal and I'm still learning the job myself, how am I going to know that the right person, because there are loud people who might not be a good leader, right? Yeah, so yeah. What, what are the skills that you observe? Um, uh, I think that's a really good question. And I had the opportunity to take uh, some uh, Disney leadership training uh, oh, this past exciting. winter, which was amazing training mm -hmm. that I've always wanted to take. And, and they talked about the Disney experience and, and their leaders and the importance of culture. And throughout the entire organization, attitude. They hire for attitude. When somebody comes in the door, they, and, and they, they um, use the example of cosmetologists, they have hundreds of cosmetologists. And they want the cosmetologist that has the smile, the ability to say, hi, how, how you doing? The positive attitude, the enthusiasm, and if that cosmetologist doesn't have necessarily the best skill set, that's okay because they can train that, mm -hmm. but they can't train attitude. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at leaders, we have to look to people who can connect well with people, who can communicate well, who have that ability to bring people together and, and get people on board to do things smile, enthusiasm, and they may not have the, the leadership skill set yet, but we can build that. Yeah. Yeah. So attitude. So, so practicing principles can be looking for people who are community minded Absolutely. and positive and every day, you know, is a fresh start and, mm -hmm. and they're not enthusiastic. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's awesome. We don't, we don't want to necessarily um, bring the the person with the the bad attitude, the the whiner, the woe is me, because we're not going to be able to change that attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that kind of attitude will always be with that person. Yeah, yeah. I firmly it's believe that. It's about the disposition. It sure is. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. You are an awesome leader. I've been privileged to oh, work with the last you. few years, and I'm so thankful that at this point in my career, we connected. And you uh, are the leader of the Gershacker Fellowship Program at Saginaw Valley State University, which is a pretty amazing opportunity. Pretty for amazing, educators. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so through that work, you have taken school leaders around the world to visit mm -hmm. schools. And Marianne, what is the biggest takeaway that the school leaders you've taken around the world to see the schools, what's the biggest takeaway that they've had um, after visiting schools regarding our work as school leaders? That's a, that's a good question. I think what I've learned is oftentimes we read about how students uh, from different countries are performing. And many times we read that they're performing at much higher levels than uh, the students in the United States. I think that what we've observed is education uh, is a part of a country's culture and the priorities of the people within that country drives education. So for example, when we have visited Asian schools, Education is the number one priority of a parent. And parents will do anything imaginable to make sure that their child has the best educational opportunity that's possible. And many times, more than many, that includes hours upon hours of study after the school day is done. Those children don't have the opportunity to engage in the activities that 
we see are so important for American students. So in uh, American schools at three o'clock or 2.15, our children many times are off to athletic practice or they're off to music lessons or they're off to dance lessons or art lessons or any of those opportunities that are a part of the school experience. In some of the countries that we visited, a child might be able to be a part of a similar experience, but it's private and there's not that peace that an American student would experience. There's not that football team. There's not that soccer team. There's not that giant band that's marching. The countries that we visit, they know that about us. They think that that's a very cool part of the American school system. So my biggest takeaway is we have lots to learn from each other, but in taking a look at that, we also need to recognize that the culture of the community, the culture of the people influences what happens. And the culture in the United States is far different, for example, than the culture in Asia. So the educational system anywhere around the world uh, is a reflection of the values of the community. Absolutely. And you can't impose your values on someone else and you can't adopt values of someone else in order to to change a system, it has to be authentic and real. And right. that it's not wrong, it's different. And what we can learn from each other is what's important. Right, for example, um, and I think Sherry, you may have been on this trip, uh, when we visited uh, Finland, in a Finnish elementary school, students are together in grades K through six, they stay as that one cohort with the same teacher for the entire yeah. time. and. And wow, that's pretty amazing, but I, I'm not thinking that that probably would go over very well here, right? Yes. I remember having a conversation with one of the elementary principals in Finland, and he was creating the, the schedule for the coming year. And he mentioned that he was thinking that he was going to have first graders uh, only go to school Monday through Thursday, and then they would go on Friday, but he would send them home early at <laughs> one o'clock. Yeah. And I said, well, where are those kids going to go? Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to walk home. Mm -hmm. And I said, walk home by themselves? Well, absolutely, they're going to walk home by themselves. Well, who will be there to, to take care of them? Well, maybe a grandma or a grandpa or somebody, but it'll all get... It'll be okay. It'll be okay. And so that elementary principal had the liberty to create a schedule for that school that worked for that school. And things look different here yes. in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Similar conversation I think we had with teachers who said, next Wednesday we need some time to plan an activity because we're taking the students, and I don't remember where they were going, but they just notified their parents that... Wednesday there would not be school right. that week. And right. that worked for everyone. Right. Right. Yeah, that would be unbelievably difficult for right. our society. But. All right, last question, uh -huh. and then we're gonna wrap it up. So, well, probably it's a two-part question. First, what was the most difficult thing that you experienced as a school leader? And then I, of course, the second part is that, how do we help school leaders overcome a similar challenge? I don't know if there was one most difficult thing because there are lots and lots of difficult things. I think that knowing that this too shall pass is a, a phrase, a strategy <laughs> that that I began to realize that, yep, this too shall pass. And I have a, a good friend who was a, a superintendent who, when we would gather and we would start to talk about whatever Thing was happening in the district and and inevitably there would be something terrible happening somewhere and he would look at that person and say I'm sorry it's just your turn mm -hmm. and I would think why are you saying that and <laughs> what I learned is it was just your turn and, and we all experience very very difficult uh, situations um, that will pass but it's important to have a a foundation of people that can support you 
and people that you can talk to and talk things out and be your truth tellers mm -hmm. and, and you'll work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've forgotten the second question. Well, the, the first question was what was the most difficult okay. thing? And you said yeah. there's lots of difficult yeah. things. Yeah. The solution is to remember to stay conscious. And even though it's emotional and it hurts and it's hard, it's you're going to be okay. Go, and yeah. depend on the people around you that you can trust. Absolutely. Marianne, thank you so much for the help with this podcast. I just feel so blessed that you were here today. Blessed for the work that you have been uh, doing on behalf of kids for many years and continue to do. So thank, thank you. you. Well, I really appreciate that. And, and I'll end on this note. I've had the opportunity to work with uh, lots of wonderful school board mm. people. And one of the individuals that I worked with for a lot of years, he would always close every communication with lead on. Yeah. And so I would like to, to end with that, that to all of you that are listening, thank you for all the work that you do and continue to lead on. Awesome. Thank you. Join us for our next episode of The Principalship, The Worst Job I Ever Loved.